Hello and welcome to The Nation. I'm your host, Daniel Rahman. After two years of virtual and hybrid summits, world leaders from around the world will be convening in, the, in New York for the 77th UN General Assembly. The first assembly in this post-COVID-19 era takes place as the planet is faced with a multitude of crises, from Russia's war in Ukraine, growing ideological extremism, climate change and environmental degradation, to economic instability and trade disputes. The high-level debates will be taking place this week. And Malaysia will be represented by our Prime Minister, Yang Ahmad Berhormat, Datuk Sri Ismail Sabri. With the eyes of the world watching, today we will be discussing the various perspectives and priorities of Malaysia at the United Nations General Assembly. I'd like to welcome our guests for today. The first is Tantri Professor Dr. Jamila Mahmud, the Executive Director of the Sunway Plan Center for Planetary Health at Sunway University, and Peter Nicole, a global analyst. Tantri and Peter, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. So let's get right into it. Recently, the United Nations released its Human Development Index Report 2022. The report highlights, and I quote, human development is failing in 90% of nations. It cites reversals in various indicators, indicators education, healthcare, poverty, gender equality. Now, I'd like to get your thoughts on what are the key takeaways from this report and what role will these new findings play in the UN General Assembly? Tantri, maybe we can start with you. Thank you, Daniel. The UN Human Development Report is a really important report because the United Nations Development Program looks at how all the different countries or member states are performing against several indicators, global indicators. And you're absolutely right, for the first time, for the first time ever, we are seeing a decline in our in, in development indicators, particularly around life expectancy, uh, income, education, and of course, gender equality as well. Now, this is obviously very worrying. It also comes against a backdrop of the pandemic in the last two years, mm -hmm. but it signals uh, a couple of things. One is that we are living in an increasingly complex world, and these complexities you know, are framed around four areas. One is, of course, the e effect of Anthropocene, or humanity's action on the planet, and the planetary health impacts of that. The second is around polarization, Third is around individual complexities and, and tensions. And fourthly, against you know, what social uh, groups and, and go governments and countries are trying to do to overcome this. So you know, against all that complexity, it's also saying that they're happening at the same time. We're having cascading crises. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> it's, it doesn't paint a very good picture globally. But what it also does is try to lift us to say that amidst all this, right, the human uh, capacity to overcome is high, but what we need is strong global leadership to actually drive change, to b come up with you know, ideas, innovations, and they framed it around three areas, looking at what investments we make, you know, what mm -hmm. insurance we take, and the third eye is, uh, I think, I can't remember the third eye now, but I remember saying that I need to have another eye, which is information, which I think is important. They'll come to me, the right. third eye. Yeah. And there's three eyes, um, Pete, maybe if you can get your thoughts um, about greater investment as well as information. Um, what do you see as the role that United Nations General Assembly can play in light of these findings? United Nations actually has always played a, a, a very key role in identifying what you know the red flags are that are out there, whether it be in, in development or whether it be support in terms of um, conflict resolution across the globe, yeah. um, but what it what it lacks is it lacks um, a lot of support uh, from international bodies, because the key to this is not actually the United Nations themselves. They can highlight, they can give you the red flags, they can give you the solutions, but really it's up to domestic governments yes. who have the responsibility to pick up what the United Nations has highlighted and quite rightly highlighted and actually then be able to implement them in you know, the domestic uh, circumstances of their own countries. So when Tansi talks about global leadership, um, yeah, th there is a lack, we see that, that they're trying very hard as a, as a body of the United Nations, but we don't have a lot of the leadership there that we've 
kind of gone insular because of the COVID Polarization pandemic. As well. That's right. So where we we had a, a a really good run over the last ten or twelve years, where these things were being identified by the United Nations and progress was being made, particularly to do with uh, humanitarian issues. Mm -hmm. um, COVID has kind of stepped us back. And where we are now is we went very insular. We saw that with the vaccine rollout, yep. particularly, mm. yep. where nations themselves look at my, me first. So it's me, 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 me yeah. first. So Whereas how do we, we overcome would this you know, sense of regionalism, right? Everybody goes, it's, it's big fanfare in the United Nations currently, mm. um, and regionalism tends to be quite strong. So mm. how do we um, you know, get countries to work together if it may not be across? Um, within sort of that, 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 that what, what draws these countries together? Country. If I may, first of all, I remember the third eye okay. is innovation. innovation yeah. um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's age. Uh, I, I think that you, know, you made a very important point, and I want to come back to that. Who sure. and what is the United Nations? Mm. Right. The United Nations is not Antonio, Antonio Guterres and all mm. the UN agencies. United Nations is us. It's yeah. actually member states that form the United Nations. Yeah. The UN, United Nations is a convener, is a secretariat that brings the leaders together, puts on the table, here are the emerging issues, here are the challenges the world's facing today. You leaders, what do we do now? And you need to take this back and apply. Mm. So your question on whether, whether it's regionalization or at national level, I think the first thing I would say is that we live in borders that were created by us. Okay. But we see now the local action and the local challenges we face have global impact. Right. We've seen this with COVID. You see this clearly with the climate crisis, and I refuse to call it climate change. It is a crisis. Yes. And I think we are seeing this with, you know, whether it's a planetary health, biodiversity crisis. We're seeing this with the economic crisis uh, and recessions that are happening. We're seeing it, the massive energy crisis. Right that has resulted from, you know, unfortunately, the Ukraine war has, you know, sort of accelerated mm -hmm. that. The sanctions have led to actually more people using coal, yeah. when actually this was a, this huge opportunity to innovate and go to green yeah. and transition energy. Yeah. So uh, just to put that down, because it's very easy to say, ah, the United Nations is hopeless. No, right. it's member states that are hopeless. It's the, the lack of leadership <laughs> yeah. that yeah. have not driven, yeah. you know, yeah. the agenda. That's, so that's, that's, that's exactly what it, what it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and taking, taking on your point, mm. I just want to jump in saying, so taking on to the point that you mentioned that the United Nations is made up of individual member states, yeah. uh, Malaysia ranks 90, 62nd out of 191 countries, yeah. uh, but within the report that falls in the very high human development category. Mm. Now, I want to get your thoughts on, yes, we are facing a lot of crises all over the world, but maybe you can share with us, what do you think Malaysia is doing right? I think from, from, uh, from an outsider's perspective, um, yeah. it's very straightforward that over the last 40 to 50 years, Malaysia has been very focused on a couple of key issues. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them is education and ensuring that people in Malaysia have access to, you know, proper education, not just at sort of primary and secondary level, but also at further education, have invested in the facilities with help from uh, the outside world so that you create an educated populace, which is the key or one of the major keys to reducing poverty. If you have an educated workforce, the chances of, of poverty reduce significantly. So those are the things that I think is done well, together with, um, with medical. Mm -hmm. um, medical facilities in Malaysia are very good when you compare it in, in ASEAN regions, you compare it across the world. So providing that human need, right. the security of human need, the medical, to be able to access medical, uh, to get proper treatment, to be able to get access to education and further your education, right. and to have those opportunities because of that. I think that's what Malaysia has done really well in terms of how it has developed. Right. Over so the education years. and healthcare, you know, Tantri, uh, um, some might disagree with you, uh, and some agree <laughs> with us on, on, on education, right? Yeah. Uh, healthcare, I mean, as an observer outside looking in, past two years of COVID, yeah. looks like we've handled us pretty well. Yeah. But do you, would you agree with people? I, th I think generally, let, let's also be um, be humble about rankings, right? Yeah. 62 out of 192 countries is a good place to be for an upper middle class, mm. uh, middle class economy, mm. that, you know, upper middle class. 
I think that you're right. You know, over many, many years since independence, we have you know, invested in education and healthcare. I think that it would be very, very dangerous for us to rest on those laurels because Absolutely. we need to invest much more. Absolutely. We see now you know, the Ministry of Education taking in a health transformation, mm -hmm. Ministry of Health taking health transformation and reform very, mm -hmm. very seriously. Because COVID has laid bare, mm -hmm. despite those investments, we have been challenged. Children were not able to get education for a number of years. We are losing one generation of, of students. Yeah, exactly. On health care, you know, we need to step up our investments in primary care and prevention and surveillance in crisis care and so on and so forth. So while it's a good place to be right now, I would say we, st we need to aspire to be better. And I think we are going to do that. And so we yeah. can definitely move up yeah. from our place on the well, that's, second. That's, that's the key to it, is that mm -hmm. we've done very well. Yeah, globally we've done very well in lots of places. Malaysia yeah. has done very well in lots of issues because of COVID, but we can do much better. Yeah. And right. that's the key to it. Right, and, and Tansri, I just want to stay with you now, uh, back to you for a moment. Um, our Prime Minister is scheduled to address the United yeah. Nations General Assembly this Friday on yeah. the 23rd of September. What do you see as priorities that will be raised um, in, our speech, in, in his speech? And what are the areas in which Malaysia should position herself as a global leader? First of all, I don't have privileged uh, information on what he will say, and I'm sure he will say the right things. But I will say what I hope he says. Mm, okay. What I hope he won't do is do what some leaders do and use the United Nations General Assembly as a place to complain. Mm -mm. Because it's a safe place to complain, media mm. attention you know, is away from it uh, domestically, uh, yeah. and then you know, media just moves on and you can complain as much as you like. But what I really hope he will do is stand up there and really call member states to rise you know, and really lead in this time of crisis. That we need solidarity, we need uh, global leaders to say we need to lower temperatures, you know, we need to put mm -hmm. fossil fuels in the ground, leave them there. Mm -hmm. We need to really quickly transition into, uh, you know, a, a new form of economy. Uh, I hope that he will ring those alarm bells loud and clear. And he is well placed to do this, right? Malaysia has committed to sustainable development goals. Malaysia is, you know, uh, uh, has a new SDG center that's going to be set up. Now, I'm privileged coming from Sunway University because Tantri Jeffichia, a, 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 um, a very successful businessman and philanthropist, had the vision to establish not just the Jeffrey Sachs Center for Sustainable Development, but also our Center for Planetary Health. Yeah. You know, we are well positioned now to support the government and the Prime Minister to lead globally, not just regionally, mm -hmm. to lead globally. There is no other center in this region. So I think that you know the Prime Minister needs to stand tall and proud to say that my country has invested in these you know policies and is committed because it's in the 12 Malaysia plan. Mm -hmm. He has called for, for a planetary health strategy and an right. action plan. You know we need to show the world how it's done. Right. Yeah, and, and I think we also need to show the world that you know the solidarity that's required now mm. is more mm. crucial than ever. Mm. You know. Right. <coughs> Indeed, as, Absolutely. Yeah, as, as someone who's worked around the region, you know, and you've, uh, you understand Malaysia, you've been here for a while, what are your thoughts then on the kind of global leadership that Malaysia can take on that world stage at this particular point in time in, you know, global, his, um, global crossroads? One, one of the things that, uh, that uh, Tansri alluded to there is really how Malaysia can and is in a position to be able to position itself as a global leader in terms of energy, renewable energy. Okay the green agenda, yeah? Because that is so critical, not only to us, right, the older people, <laughs> right, but to the younger generation. Yeah. This is very key. And politicians need to be able to understand how key that is for that younger populace. And we have a lot of younger uh, populations throughout the region, and Malaysia is the same. So Malaysia is, is, is perfectly um, situated. You, you have incredible uh, natural resources here yeah. in wind and tide and solar, right? And yet we are still not really developing it no. properly. And there is also a huge impact to people's energy security here as yeah. well, because we know that the price per kilowatt of renewable energy sources is about 80% cheaper 
than current fossil fuels, yeah. right, through oil, whatever. <laughs> and of course, we've got the issue where the longer you dig, drill, and extract uh, fossil fuels, oil particularly, the more costly it becomes. We've seen this in the North Sea as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's an impact, an economic impact there yeah. in terms of that. Of course, you've, you've painted a very positive picture on our ability to be global leaders, mm. but you know, I, I just sort of want to um, get your thoughts on the fact that we see um, recent investments from around the world, big organizations, not necessarily landing in Malaysia. Mm. So how do you reconcile that global leadership <coughs> a possibility that we have and kind of the you know, investment trade realities that are happening around us. There's, there's, very a, there's, a, there's, a, sim there's a simple key to it, and it's called political stability. Okay. Um, foreign direct investment, mm. when they're doing due diligence, they're looking mm. at how politically stable is the nation that I'm yeah. going to invest in. And if we don't have political stability in a country, you will not see the levels of FDI that you would expect to see, and that you see in other countries where it is quite stable. Yeah. So that is really one of the keys, I think, for Malaysia, we've been talking about this for some considerable time now, yeah. is that once we have that political stability in the country, yeah. you would naturally expect, and it would be safe and credible to expect, that, that foreign direct, direct investment will be coming in, and will increase as companies in, in Malaysia develop various uh, industries. Do you I agree think it's, it's also it's that that's very important. The other thing is how do we remain competitive, right? Yes. And I think yes. how we remain competitive is are our policies that actually uh, create a conducive environment mm -hmm. for foreign investment uh, in place. Mm -hmm. So I think that's going to be very critical. For us to be competitive, we need to be able to be you know less bureaucratic we need mm -hmm. to be able to maintain our proficiency in the english language uh, we need to be able to you know be out there engaging on multilateral global issues mm -hmm. you know because it, it counts when people mm -hmm. see you know a country is actually engaged in a lot of these multilateral global uh, dialogues mm -hmm. and bringing their leadership on board and i think that you, i completely concur with you malaysia has you know su those elements and mm -hmm. this is why uh, foreign direct investment has been very high here and very strong, right? So I think, you know, how do we now make sure that this is something that's not, oh, as an add-on, we need to have that. No, it's how you run the country and how you structure your policies so that that conducive environment is, is there. Well, um, I, think, I think also that it's very important that, you know, that the country understands that being a member of an organization such as ASEAN yeah. is not the key itself. You have to lead when you're in that yes. organization. And I was going to get to that point. Um, you know, an area often not talked about is the United Nations. While a platform for states, mm. there also needs to be um, collaboration yes. right? yes. with yep. NGOs, civil society yep. organizations, yep. innovators, the startups yep. and, and yes. the MNCs. Now, how do you see the role being played by this private sector, civil society sector in order to you know, realize what is being said at the United General Assembly? Um, I, I think that it's always been um, part of the UN's brief to engage with yeah. the private sector <coughs> and NGOs. I mean, if you look at a lot of the the work that the UN has done, particularly in health and healthcare in, in North Africa and West Africa and a lot of really impoverished countries, um, it's been under the UN banner, but it has been financed and led by private sector and by yeah. NGOs, right. uh, Doctors Without Borders and people mm. like that doing it. So I would expect to see that continue. Um, I don't think there'll be any change. My only fear is that because of the incredible stresses that are on uh, economies across the globe at the moment, that the ability of those NGOs to continue to finance the work that they do uh, could be disrupted. And therefore, the ability of the UN to <coughs> deliver what they want also could be disrupted because of that lack of financing as we have these economic and stresses. And country as somebody with yeah. a lot so of I international <laughs> humanitarian <laughs> organization uh, yeah. experience. Uh, yeah. As you were speaking, I was remembering my my times in the UN and mm. the General Assembly. Mm. And what do you remember, you know, number one, it's not just the global leaders are speaking. Mm. Yes, you have the high level segment that will take place next uh, soon from 20th. 
But I think we also have global leaders, like we had Bill Gates, Leonardo DiCaprio, you know, Angelina Jolie. We had Greta Thunberg calling out member states, right? And those who remember, we had, of, of course, you know, former President Trump calling Kim Jong-un, you know, little <laughs> rocket man. I mean, these are the things that are very momentous in the General Assembly, right? Yeah. But, you know, the, the, the United Gen Nations uh, General Assembly, just to, to be clear, the high-level segment is a very political one. Mm. In the fringes of that, you have, you know, the Climate Summit, the Education summit other political uh, other political dialogues as well and I think this is where the business uh, sector has really stepped up right mm -hmm. uh, we know that in you know, the World Economic Forum is present at the UN General Assembly other business con conglomerations and coalitions are also there civil society is very powerful and in the United Nations they are present they are visible they are heard and I think where we need to do what we need to do much more in Malaysia is invest in civil society uh, and invest in partnerships. Mm -hmm. I think where we need to strengthen is really our willingness to collaborate. And we've seen when you actually have a collaborative approach, uh, private sector, civil society coming together, whether it was in the COVID response, the vaccination program, 50% of our vaccinations right. were run by the private sector yeah, and right. NGOs, right? Yeah. Speaking so this of, is important. That's yeah. right. And, and, and speaking of which, then the theme you know, of this year's General Assembly is a watershed moment, transformative solutions Absolutely. to interlocking challenges. Yes. Now, I just want to get a bit topical where we've spoken about a few things earlier, like the climate crisis. Um, what do you see as potential solutions um, in addressing these irreversible effects that a lot of the reports have pointed out? I just want to get uh, onto this point because I feel it's very important in the larger scale of things. No, I think the, 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 the key, as we discussed earlier, is the willingness of individual domestic government to take up this green agenda. So COP26 in Glasgow uh, last year laid out again another framework uh, and a timeline framework uh, for the delivery of renewable energy and green energy to get rid of this carbon footprint, to get rid of our uh, dependence on fossil fuels. Right. So it's going to be, the United Nations is going to be the sort of the, the voice that is continually in the ears of the governments who are going to have to deliver this. Right, Tansri? I will use one word, courage. Yes. I think we need political mm. courage to yes. do the right thing, even though it's not popular. And I'm going to say something very unpopular right now. The fact that post-COVID, the biggest increase was actually in the number of cars being sold. Mm. The fact that our petroleum is subsidized, the fact that we don't have an efficient and green public transportation system, this requires courage and leadership to actually put in place some very, very solid policies on a transition mm. towards a green energy. I'm not saying it can happen overnight, but we need to have that commitment, which requires one point, which is actually in the Human Development Report. It's about us. It's, mm. Don't blame the government. It's about us. Our thirst for things that mm. are plastic. We're the highest per capita consumer of single-use plastic. Yeah. You know, we are we are the biggest polluter. Uh, you know, we are even higher than Singapore and other countries in ASEAN. We have CO2 emissions, you know, off, off, the, off the, you know, charts. Mm. So it's us, our individual behaviours. If we start to individually change the way we consume, the way we look at the health of the planet, how it has impact on our health and our survival, if we can be better stewards, right, then it will be easier for the government to start implementing some of these policies. Right. And on the point of stewardship, um, on everybody's minds in Malaysia is the upcoming 15th general election. And of course, the PM will be in, in, in the UN, uh, positioning Malaysia on the global stage. But back at home, there'll be priorities to be looked into. Um, last words, if I can have, uh, what do you see as the Prime Minister's priorities as he positions as he positions uh, Malaysia or himself, both as a, as a national as well as a global leader? Um, I think, again, from, uh, from an outsider's perspective, what we'd be looking for is we'd be looking for some real leadership in resolving the cost of living crisis, okay. the economic crisis that we're facing. That's the major impact for everybody. And that's what everybody's talking about. That's what everybody's worried about. That's where the anxiety comes from, you know? Um, I'm still going to have a job. How am I going to survive if I don't have a job? I can't really survive even today. I'm, I'm struggling to survive. So the economy uh, post-COVID, this recovery period from COVID, is going to be probably the most challenging part for any 
um, country leader anywhere in the world at the moment, mm -hmm. and uh, your prime minister is not going to be exempt from that. So what I'd be looking for is I'd be looking for some very strong economic uh, policies to help Malaysia not only get out of this cost of living crisis, but also to get rid of its dependency on these fossil fuels and get us into a green economy. And we've got about one minute left. I would say that beyond the economic, I think it is important, but doing it in a way that is not going to harm the planet. I yeah. think that it's very, very important that he takes leadership. There's no point having an economy when, the, when we're going to have an existential crisis, yeah. which we are facing right now. So economic, economic development, with planetary health at the heart of it. And I think this is the opportunity for him to drive a new agenda, take leadership, and drive the world towards that, that common goal. Sustainable economic development. Yes. Tan Sri, Pete, thank you very much for those thoughts. I really like the idea that we have to look into cost of living while also addressing bigger issues as well as planetary health. That's all the time we have here today. Um, we have been in conversation with Tantri Jamila Mahmood, Executive Director of the Sunway Plan Centre for Planetary Health at Sunway University, and Peter Nicole, a global analyst. We spoke about Malaysia at the United Nations, and we've, received, we've heard today many perspectives as well as priorities. Uh, that's all the time we have for this week. Thank you for tuning in with us. Till next time. <laughs>